So, two years ago, maybe three years ago, nearly to the day, I posted a video on YouTube and it was titled 700 horsepower ZTEC turbo build. Now, I stripped the engine, basically all I did in the video was strip the engine down, I sent the block away for machining. The plan was, a few days later, well actually about a week later, um, I was going to upload another video of me assembling the engine. But what actually happened was, life took over, I got really really busy, other things took priority, my wife got pregnant, I had a daughter, and um, yeah, just life got really really busy basically. So uh, now, two years later, here we are. Um, someone asked the other day, what actually happened to that 700 horsepower ZTEC build that you was doing? And uh, I'll show you. There it is, look. It's been sat in the corner of this workshop all that time. It does look like it's quite dirty and dusty, and that's because it is. It hasn't been covered up. It has been covered in like a thin layer of oil, so all the dirt has stuck to it, but you know, hopefully it's preserved the engine underneath. So today, I'm going to pull it out, and I'm going to start assembling it. Let's crack on. So for those of you that are new to the channel, have not seen any of my um, previous videos or anything like that, generally I spend most of my time in my farm unit where I've got a 1200 horsepower dyno and we map a load of stuff and just get up to all that sort of stuff really. Um, where I am now, this is where I work full time. I tend to work here from eight till five, Monday to Friday. And then when five o'clock comes, um, that's when ignition advantages starts. And um, I work every night just doing general repairs, you know, clutches, servicing MOTs, timing belts, all that sort of stuff. Um, and that's sort of my main income, my bread and butter, if you know what I mean. That's how I make my living. Um, and then the YouTubing and the dynoing stuff, that's kind of on the side. Um, so I get a lot of people ask me, you know, when's the next video going to be? When's the next video going to be? And I don't even know when my next meal's going to be. Like, my life is just so hectic at the minute and I'm just running around constantly. Um, it's now half past eight on a Thursday night, the 27th of January, if you really need to know that. And uh, one of my jobs has cancelled, so um, I've got a spare couple of hours. So that's why I'm going to start building this engine. Um, I haven't really got a plan for my videos. I sort of just go with the flow and just see how they work out and just go with it, basically. So yeah, right, let's do it. So uh, I'm going to start assembling the engine now. Um, first thing I'm going to do is gap the rings. Um, I don't build engines for a living, um, so you might see me doing things a little bit unconventional, but the way I've done things for my cars have always worked, so I've kind of just stuck with it. Um, the reason why I don't build engines for a living um, is I think if I t it'll kind of take the fun away from it. If you start doing something full time, it ends up just sort of you know killing it for you, if you know what I mean. Um, it's the same with the tuning. I tend to only do tuning on Saturdays because if I had to do it full time for a living, I'd end up hating it and I'll just end up, you know, I know what I'm like, I'll just sell everything and just cut my tyres kind of thing. But um, so yeah, just wanted to get that out of the way. Let's crack on with this engine. So I'm not going to clean it all up. I'm just going to take the studs out the top of the block. These are only hand tight anyway. Um, this is one of my M12 stud and nut conversions. Um, I'm going to just clean up the bores just so they're clean for the rings. And I'm going to square the rings up in the bore. Um, I'm going to obviously check for the clearance in the end gap and stuff like that. And then grind to suit. So yeah, I won't bore you. I'll just crack on. So I'm not really going to disclose what kind of like ring gaps are run and stuff like that because everyone's different. I will say I'm going to build this engine as what's known as loose. So um, the ring gaps are going to be slightly on the big side of everything really. Um, just because, you know, I don't mind if there's a little bit of oil consumption or something like that. Because it's not like I'm going to, you know, this is not a daily drive of this engine. It's just going to be flat out for hopefully 10 seconds or less. Um, so yeah, I don't mind checking the oil after every run and stuff like that. So yeah, but um, generally you get the installation guide with the pistons when you buy them anyway. Just go by that and you, you can't really go wrong. Um, I've got a really nice tool. This is made by Summit and um, this is used for um, squaring up the piston rings in the uh, top of the cylinder um, just for when you measure them. Um, so yeah, I'm going to do that now. Mm. Ba -ba 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 Nice. <laughs> Top. Oh, you know what? That first top ring is about there, you know? Double check. 
Yeah, pretty happy with that. Definitely spoke too soon there though. Cylinder number two. It's definitely a bit tight. I'm gonna open that up slightly. Put the feeder gauge away. One knob. Oh, just slightly on the tight side still. Little bit more, I reckon. Just grabbing the feeler gauge. Yeah. Tedious stuff, but it's got to be done. Right, I'm gonna do the rest of them. I'm not gonna bore you. I kind of feel like I haven't really explained what I'm doing that well. Um, so I'm just on the last top ring on cylinder number four. Um, so I'll just give you a little rundown of what I'm actually doing. So what I do is, I've got all the rings laid out, cylinders one, two, three, and four, all with the pistons, gudgeon pins, circle clips, retaining clips, whatever you want to call them. Um, now these rings, they've got what's called a ring gap. So as you can see, you've got a little, when they're like, if you imagine it assembled on the actual piston, you have, when they're in the bore, you push the rings together to get the um, pistons in the bore. And that little gap in the end there is called the ring gap. And if that gap's too tight, then what happens is, um, when the engine runs up to temperature, when you're at full boost, whatever, um, that the end of the ring tend, can butt up and when it butt up, butts up you get um, what's called I believe some people refer to it as ring flutter or it, it shudders up and down the um, up and down the bore and it can crack ring lanes and stuff like that um, so you need to get this gap right basically um, obviously the bigger the gap the safer it is but if you go too big then you start burning oil and you can have compression issues eventually and stuff like that and um, so basically what you do uh, i'm going to try and do this one-handed so forgive me if i look a bit cack handed make sure the rings are right way up um, it is labeled all piston rings and pistons are different put the ring in the bore obviously bore number four cylinder number four rather the reason why i cover the other three with um just a cloth is to stop my simple brain getting confused and accidentally putting it in, a, in the wrong cylinder and so yeah that's what that's for and um, you stick that in there you then need to square the ring up in the actual cylinder itself so i use this and that basically just it's got a little lip on it so you just push it into the cylinder and it just squares the ring up like that Take your feeler gauge, if you don't know what feeler gauge is, then stop watching this video now. And all you're doing with the feeler gauge is, you're measuring, just trying to slide it in that ring gap in the end there. You probably can't see it that well, but you're just trying to get it in there. And as you can see, it won't fit because it's too tight. So what you do is gently spin the ring out of the ball. Come on. And then this is my, um, this is my piston ring grinding tool. So basically what you do is, you put the ring on here, you slide it up against them little pins, like that, just to make sure it's square with each other, and then you basically hold it flat with your fingers, and then you, you crank the handle. You always turn the handle that way, so that you're grinding down into the ring as such, rather than up away from the ring. And then once you've actually ground it, you should really clean up the edges with um, uh, what's called a ring file. Can't quite remember where my ring file is, so I will have to find that and do that. But you can do it with like wet and dry sandpaper or something like that, just to make sure there's no like little burrs on the en end of the ring. Um, so yeah, that's basically what I'm doing here. Let me demonstrate that for you. So got the ring the right way up. I always tend to grind off of one side only and then hold it flat nice and firm I'm not pushing hard into it I'm not going mad and then that's it as you can see it's nice and shiny on that edge there where I've ground a little bit away so then you go back to here Whoop, bleh, nearly dropped my camera stay put the ring back into the bore Square it up. And 
and measure again. Whoa, still just a little bit tight. So yeah, basically you just keep going back and forth doing that. And eventually when it's just, just dragging on the edge of the feeler gauge I like, um, when it's just dragging, that's normally just about the right clearance. Um, so yeah, I've got this one last ring to finish off. And then I've got to go on to the, uh, the second rings, which are here. And then you've got the all scraper rings. The all scraper rings are not so important, but I do check them anyway. Um, the second ring has a completely different gap as a, compared to the top ring. And so just you know, take that into consideration. Right, let's crack on. So my piston rings are all gapped. They're all back in the box with all the pistons and stuff now set to one side. I've just dragged my uh, crankshaft down. It's been upstairs and um, I thought for a minute that it was uh, gone rusty, but actually, you can't really see it that well on the camera, but it's actually just the engineer's oil that was left on it. And um, this is a, a standard grind crank. Um, so, which basically means it hasn't been ground. It's not over, doesn't need oversized shells or anything like that. And uh, that's the type of crank that I tend to like to use. I don't really want to use, um, you know, a ground crank because just obviously unground is a lot stronger. So yeah, that's what that is. Um, it's just a standard two litre focus. It's just had a polish. Well, it was polished a couple of years ago now, but it's still good. Uh, do need to clean up the nose of the crank a little bit because that was poking out. It was all like wrapped up tight, apart from that bit of poked through. So, but that's just where the um, uh, timing belt lower sprocket locates. So that's absolutely fine. I'm going to clean that up. Um, yeah, let's crack on. And cut a long story short, it's now another day. Um, so just to give you a rundown what's happened, um, I was looking at the top of the, the like, top of the block and stuff like that, and there was a few little blemishes and a little couple of marks that I weren't happy with. So I sent the block away and I had it decked. So basically just had like the top of the block skimmed off. So it's uh, a lot cleaner now, ready for the uh, gasket to seal up against. So yeah. <coughs> Now I'm going to clean the block up and hopefully going to uh, try and get the crank in tonight. That'd be nice. So yeah, let's crack on. And just like that, it's all clean. My cleaning process isn't really that exciting. I just use like a, a water washable degreaser. Um, just spray it all over the engine block. Um, scrub it in with a scrubby brush, you know, down all the bores and stuff like that. And then just hit it with a hot wash, like a hot, you know, hot cartridge jet wash thing, just to blast all the crap off. And that's it really. Obviously before I cleaned it, I just cleaned up all the faces. I gave it a light hone in all the bores and stuff like that. Cause this block has been sitting for a number of years. Um, I cleaned up obviously, oh yeah, it was like, I get wet and dry. No, oh, let me turn it over and show you properly. So I use like wet and dry sandpaper and I just clean up all the faces, especially like the mating faces where the bearings sit and stuff like that. Um, I do still need to dry off a little bit. It's still quite wet. I'm just hitting it with a camera quickly. Um, so yeah, other than that, that's about as exciting as it gets. I know some people like will clean the block up with wire wheels and sand it down and all that sort of thing. You know, paint them and make them look all pretty, but I ain't no buffy. I'm just not fussed. You know, I'm, I'm more than happy with the, uh, the full standard black that it come in. So that will do for me. So yeah, right, let's dry it off a bit better and uh, start assembling it. Right, block's all cleaned up. <whistles> Lovely. Uh, same scenario with the crankshaft. Again, just here with a load of degreaser, scrubbed it all in, buffed it all up, washed it all off, job done. Uh, right, I need to get the uh, bottom end shells in now. Woo -hoo, it's getting there. Slowly but surely. Tedious, isn't it? Right. So I have everything laid out, ready to go. Box all cleaned up. Enough of my standards anyway. Uh, obviously got the ARP stud and nut kit for the uh, main cap bolts. These are a must. Um, got all the caps cleaned up, got all the shells laid out, all ready to go. Now this next part I'm about to do, I've got a feeling this is gonna offend a lot of people. But this is how I do it, this is how I've always done it. It's never failed me, so I'm not gonna change my ways. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this is exactly what I do. So, in this tub here, is a tiny little bit amount of ATF or automatic transmission fluid. And I put a small little smear on the back. Yes, the back, the back of the bearing. Not a lot, just a little bit. I know some people are saying it should be dry, but I always do this just to, uh, when you're pulling the crank down or talking it up, if the bearing's not quite sitting right, or it's picked up a little bit, or it's a little bit of, tiny little imperfections or anything like that it just uh lubricates the back of the bearing enough just so that when you pull it down 
it can actually um, square itself up and seat without binding or getting any high spots or anything like that. I know a lot of people are a bit weirded out by this. I know a lot of uh, old school people don't like doing it this way. Um, but this is the way I've done it. This is how I've been taught. And uh, this is what I'm always going to carry on doing. So yeah, tiny little bit of thin ATF all there. Automatic transmission fluid for people who don't know what ATF is. Uh, so yeah, there we go. Right, now we get the shells in. Always got to make sure you line up the oil holes in the actual bearings themselves with the oil drillings in the block. Because uh, if you get them wrong, you're soon going to know about it. of the main for the lubrication of the main shells i use the lucas assembly lube it's so like, the reason i use this it's very like thick and gloopy it's very like um it's like jelly and it just hangs about a little bit longer so when you first fire the engine up for the first time you know it just make sure that you've got like oil there so yeah that's why i use this like that and give it a little smear just so it's on the face of all the bearing rather than just in the gully where the oil runs. Put a bit on the thrust washer as well. Both sides, don't be stingy. Beautiful. Bosh! Right, let's get the crank in. Careful. Right, same again, a little bit of ATF on the back of the caps. Just a little bit. five get in there wash job done right now we got to put the uh, main cap studs in now mm. let's crack on now again it's totally personal preference but i put these studs in dry so i don't put no lubricant on them or any locks or anything stupid like that um these are not meant to be that tight you literally just nip them into the block you don't talk them down they do have an allen key hole in the top but that's just for sending them in um you don't talk them down or put them in tight or anything like that. The reason I don't put lube on them is because it is a, a, a blind hole. Um, so if you put like some sort of an oil or a lubricant around there, when you tighten the stud down, there's nothing to um, sort of let the the compressed air out as such. And you can like hydrolock the bolt as such. Um, so if you put it in dry and do it by hand, you tend to get like a feel of the bolt going in. Um, again, it's entirely up to you. This is just the way that I do it and the way I always have done it. So I will continue to do it this way. Ugh. Three. Four. Five. The main caps on, obviously they're numbered, one, two, three, four, five, and they're also arrowed. The arrows point towards the timing belt end. So yeah, let's get the studs on and then we can pull it down a bit and call it a night, I think, because it's uh, quarter to nine and uh, I'm hungry, tired, and really want to shower. So yeah. So when it comes to ARP, assembly grease i go a bit overkill and i'll put grease on both sides of the washer again it's completely up to you everyone's different this is the way i've always done it never been caught out never had any problems so this is how we'll continue to do it i know some people either don't like to put grease on the washer which i just think is mad and some people if they do they only put it on one side and then some people put it on both sides i go a bit over the top and just put it on both sides but what i do do is once i've <laughs> what i do do once I've pulled it down tight and it's all talked up and the final talk's done, and I have a tendency to clean all the excess grease off, just give it a wipe, 
um, just in case, like, you know, there's a little too much of it floating around the engine on the first fire up and stuff, but yeah. So that's that. Obviously, I also put a CMV lube on the studs. It'd be crazy not to. I'm sure there's gonna be some people watching this thinking, what is this Muppet doing? Just remember, not everyone's the same. We don't all build things the same, we're all different. If you wanna copy me, feel free. If you don't, completely understand. Right, the nuts. Well, it's not pulled down tight yet, but we can still do the test. This is the scary bit. Oh, lovely. I'm happy with that. It's where it locks up when I talk it down, isn't it? <laughs> right, that'll do for tonight. I will carry on tomorrow. Bye. Morning, another day, another spare hour. So I'm gonna crack on with the engine, obviously. Um, Gonna start putting the uh, pistons and rods in, basically. Yeah, it's about as exciting as it gets, I suppose. Um, I have a tendency to be putting the, I put the pistons on the rods first before I actually put the rings on the piston, just because it gives me something to hold on to when I'm sort of like putting the rings on. Uh, K1 rods, obviously, wouldn't use anything else. Uh, Wooden forged pistons, and that's about it, really. My one focus RS pistons, if you must know. So yeah, right. Let's get it built up. I always put one circle pin first in every piston. Um, you can just push these in by hand. He says. Like that. Job jobbed. This is not my first rodeo. So I've already built one up here. Um, what I tend to do is just, I lube all the pins up, slide them in the piston a little bit of the way and then lube, lube up all the small end. Um, the reason why I like to use the, the K1 rods over anything else is they have a very, very thin bush um, in the actual small end. It might just be me, but I've seen other rods with like a thicker sort of walled bush, if that makes sense. And um, after you like give them death and hammer them, sometimes the bush can actually fall out or deform. So I think um, you know, a nice thin bush just tends to be a little bit stronger. I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but this is why I use them. So yeah, let's build them up. Obviously make sure you get the rods the right way round, as well as the pistons. Oh yeah. Again, Lucas Assembly Lube. It's a little bit too goopy for this side of it really, but I still prefer it. Each to their own. So got all the pistons and rods built up. You need to make sure that the uh, sir clip actually seats because sometimes they can sit a little bit proud. They look like they're in, but they're not. So I give them a little little poke with a, a gentle poke with a screwdriver just to make sure they're in. Pretty happy with all them. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, another thing I didn't film, but I've put all the all squirter jets back in. So yeah, um, that's all ready to go. I did put a little bit of Loctite on the bolts. I know it's another blind hole, so you shouldn't really put that kind of lubricant on there but full do so i'm gonna do it as well so yeah um, right i'm gonna talk the main caps up build the rings up on the pistons and get them built up in the you know get them pushed in the block right let's do it um okay so the instructions that come with the alp uh, main stud and nut kit are um they need to be basically talked to 80 foot pounds um but it needs to be done in three equal stages i'm going to be using my trusty snap on digital torque wrench the uh, 381 does actually go up to 80 foot pounds, so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to do a, a run of 40, a run of 60, and then a run of 80. So, yeah, nice and simple. See? Oh, I'm tired now. 80 foot pound. I oh, will just double check the instructions just to be sure. Following the manufacturer's recommendations, torque settings, torque settings tighten the nuts in three equal steps to 80 foot pounds. 
with ARP Ultra Torque Fastener Lube Assembly. Alright. Sounds like the way this, I wish I had a, a fancy engine stand that actually bolted to the floor. Or an assistant that weren't on lunch. Is it in the head bolts? Bosh, that's then talked up. Moment of truth. Please still turn, please still turn, please still turn. Oh, lovely. Right, let's get these assembled, shall we? Right, I'm gonna be building up piston number two. Obviously, we've already gapped the rings uh, to each individual cylinder, hence the pistons are numbered. Obviously, the ring packs are numbered for the rings that I've already gapped. Um, I'll build the pistons up from the top down. I know not everyone's the same, but that's just how I do it. All scraper rings first. Obviously get the orientation right. These you can kind of just manipulate on with your hands, I find. Just make sure, obviously, they seat right. Dee 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 dee, he says. There you go, all scraper ring. Obviously the cutouts in the all scraper ring, you always want to offset them. So one's one side, one's the other. It doesn't overly matter, because once an engine's been running, the springs do rotate anyway, but it's just nice to, I don't know, it's just good practice just to offset the, uh, the cuts in the rings. Obviously making sure the rings are clean. Double check that you're putting the right ring in the right groove. Right, this is the, the center ring or the compression ring. Careful. Whoop. Don't want to stretch it too much. Beautiful, he says, because it doesn't seat. There we go. Um, I haven't put no oil on these yet. Obviously, I will oil them before the piston goes into the bore. Not an animal. And the top compression ring or the fire ring. Cut out so opposite each other. Don't want to go stretching them out too much, you know, you just open them up just enough so you can slot them over the piston. So yeah, that's the piston all built up. So I'm gonna put number one piston in the bore. Um, I'm gonna use 530 engine oil to lubricate the rings. Personal preference rather than the assembly lube. Um, I put a load in the rings to work the rings around, work all the oil behind the rings and stuff like that. Same with the oil scraper ring. And um, the type of piston ring compressor I use, obviously I don't build engines full time, I never will. It's too time consuming and if I did it for a job I wouldn't enjoy it. Is this. This is just an eBay special compressor. Um, they work really well, just have to be very careful with them and I'll show you how and why. Um, right. Make sure it's clean. All the four, uh, number one we are doing. I've got a little bit of staining on top of the block. Just where it uh, got a little bit wet and it's obviously got a few little rust stains but that's nothing too mad.
Right, so I've oiled all the piston rings up, I've taken the cap off. I don't put the uh, big end shell in yet. So I'm always too scared that it's gonna, um, when I pop the piston in, I'm scared it's gonna like hit the crank. And if it's gonna, if anything's gonna contact by accident, I'd rather just the open end of the rod hit like the all squirt or the edge of the crank. As much as I obviously try to not make it collide, sometimes the inevitable dove ha does happen and I wouldn't want a shell to hit it, if that makes sense, because the shell's quite soft compared to the uh, steel rod. So yeah, I've oiled the piston, I've oiled the top of the bore. This piston ring compressor needs opening up more. Again, these ain't the best. They do really nice um, like tapered sleeves that you can use, but I just don't want to invest the money because I don't rebuild really engines that often, as I've said. Repeat myself a bit here, aren't I? Right, so what you have to be careful of when you're tightening these up is that you don't get the rings caught because I have broken a ring in the past. You only do it once. Wobble, wobble. Just jiggling it around as I'm tightening it up just to squash all the rings. And you want to leave a little bit of the piston showing just to align it in the bore. Try and get the actual ring compressor fairly level. About there should do it. So what I do is put the piston in the bore. Obviously make sure the arrow's facing the timing belt. Double check the rods in the right way round. Now, once I get it like that, got it to this stage, I use a rubber hammer. Should probably use a cleaner rubber hammer, but still. And if you see the top of this isn't quite level, you just tap that down. And what that does, it levels it up with the top of the ball. Now, I'm just gonna make sure that that's still tight. Ooh, one more click out of that. Make sure the crank's out of the way, best as I can. Line it up, rubber end of the rubber hammer. It's clean, I promise. Done. This is number one. Woohoo! Right, just gotta do that three more times. Let's crack on. Now, I know I've like waffled on about these. Um, being pretty crap and cheap um, and they are pretty crap and cheap you can get them for like a 10 or off of ebay um, i know a few engine builders that absolutely despise these and i can understand why because i was actually pushing a piston into a ball once and um the edge of the um the metal here actually got sucked down into the ball and wedged between the piston and the ball which is quite annoying didn't do no damage it was fine but i was obviously like there's got to be a better solution to this and there is they do make really nice like bits of kit out there but again i know i've said it already but this works fine for me and if you're building engines at home I'm sure it'll work fine for you just do it the way I've done it and you probably won't come unstuck just go easy but yeah it's all a learning curve right I'll flip the engine upside down and uh, I've got the rod here so I'm going to clean up in here little smear of ATF my specialty I'm going to put the big end in uh, and then I'm going to put the big end bearing in the cap clean all the crank up oil it all up with a bit of a uh, Lucas assembly lube bolt it all up Align the numbers and align the cutouts. Some more ALP two thousand assembly loop. Again, I'm going to put it on the threads and I'm going to put it on the back of the bolt. I am going to be quite generous because I'd rather put too much on and then clean it off rather than not enough on and it binds up and doesn't pull down secure. That's always been my thinking anyway. Bosh! I'm not going to talk them down yet. I'll wait until I've got like obviously all four in and then I can just talk them all up in one go. Um, torque settings with a um, ARP rod bolts are a little bit weird. You're meant to sort of do them by stretch of the bolt, but 
you can just lube them up and talk them down to the correct specification without measuring the actual stretch because I don't have a stretch gauge. Again, not a lot of money, but I don't build enough to worry and I've never had a failure, so meh. Right, as always, let's get on with it. And just like that, all the pistons are in. Da 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 da. <laughs> Lovely job, get in there. Right. right, I need to talk up the main cap bolts. No, I don't. I need to talk up the big end bolts. I've done the main caps. So, going by my lovely instructions here that come with the K1 rods, my bolts are 7 16th by 1.6 inch. Um, I know that because I have measured them from under bolt height. Sorry about the mess, trying to do it with one hand again. Under bolt height, there to there, it's about 1.6, blah, blah, blah. So, it's this. So, the settings for this is 30 foot pounds followed by 60 degrees. So, I'm going to do 30 foot pound across the board. And then I'm going to do 60 degrees across the ball. Let's crack on. Right. 30 foot pound across the ball. One. Two. Three. Four. Five, six, seven, eight. Right, now I need to do, uh, what one was it? That one, 60 degrees. So what we do is we change this to angles. Leave it there to zero. Bosh. Set that to 60 degrees. And now it's an angle gauge. Woo Proper tools. 60 degrees coming up. And you can actually ratchet while doing the angle, which is pretty cool. 60. Sixty. Last one. Sixty-one, never mind. As you can see, it actually says sixty-one degrees and it took 80, 89 foot pounds to get it there. Best tool crunch ever. Right, I'm gonna have a tidy up. I don't like mess, believe it or not. Right, let's have a clean up and we'll crack on with the next stage. Um, got the oil pump on? Well, I say I've got the oil pump on. I haven't really got the oil pump on. This is an oil pump shell, um, but I actually got all the oil pumps. It's got no gears and it's got no back plate or anything like that. All it really does is divert the oil from the, um, obviously the oil filter housing across into the block um, with obviously the little gasket behind it. Cause I run an external oil pump kit um, cause obviously the ZTEC oil pumps are prone for failing. So I don't run them. Um, I've got an external oil pump that you'll see when I sort of finish building this engine. And um, that runs off the nose of the crank. And it's just like a belt driven oil pump. Um, that sucks the oil out the pan into an external oil pump and then feeds it into like an adapter that goes on the oil filter house, on the oil filter where, where the oil filter screws is like an adapter housing. And then it feeds the oil straight into the engine that way. So this housing, all it really does is hold the um, crankshaft oil seal. And obviously, you know, it's got somewhere for the sump to seal and stuff like that. So yeah, I know it looks grubby, but I have cleaned it. I promise it is quite spotless. Um, it's clean enough for my needs anyway. It'll do the job. Um, right, clean up a few more bits and then carry on.